Hello, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the day so far. My name is Stephanie Goslin, and I'm honoured to be your host for a couple of the sessions this afternoon. I want to begin by thanking our presenting sponsor today, GSK. It is sponsorship like these that help us to put these symposiums together. Just a reminder that if you have a question for our speaker for this session, please type that question into the chat box on the right of your screen, and we will leave time for a question and answer period at the end of the session. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Barb van der Heiden, who will be leading us through this next session, Ovarian Cancer Canada's OVCAN initiative, Advancing Scientific Discoveries. Barb is a senior scientist at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, the Corinne Boyer Chair in Ovarian Cancer Research, and the Chair of the OVCAN Governing Council. Welcome, Barb. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it is my great pleasure to be here, um, and especially to be able to have the chance to talk about OVCAN. Um, it is a, an initiative that I have been thrilled to be part of since the outset, um, and I, uh, I hope you enjoy our story, and particularly the achievements we've made um, in the first two years of this initiative. Next slide, please. So the goals of this particular session um, are threefold. Uh, the first I will describe very briefly, how did we get here um, and the important role that many people played in ensuring that there was sufficient funds for research for ovarian cancer. The second part will be on describing what is OVCAN, how we identified our research priorities and our focus on the whole uh, um, approach from both bench to bedside. And then the third part I'll focus on the longest is what have we achieved so far. Um, keeping in mind that we have, um, we are only two years into the project and the funding has only been available to us for just over a year. So everything I'm about to say has been work that has been accomplished in just over a year. So we'll start with how did we get here? Um, well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> so there was a lot of people involved and it took about four years of advocacy organized by Ovarian Cancer Canada for us to get here. That ad advocacy involved a lot of patients, a lot of survivors, uh, researchers, uh, OCC staff, spending a lot of time on Parliament Hill, meeting with various federal representatives, um, 400 volunteers altogether, um, 4,000 online letters and documents that were sent to the House of Commons that had 13,000 signatures. Um, but the end result of all that was in March uh, 2019, the federal government announced an allocation of $10 million to Ovarian Cancer Canada uh, to fund the research that we had proposed. That initiative we began to call OVCAN. I chose that name because of the power that comes behind it. The ovarian obviously for ovary and the CAN because we can, this is Canada and it is ovarian cancer. So it has a triple meaning and um, I think it wraps all the sentiments that we have about this initiative in one word. I do need to acknowledge all the people in the photos on the right hand side because they are just a few of the 40 volunteers um, that participated and particularly the patients who were critical in telling their stories to the MPs that we visited. Next slide. So that's uh, how we got here and then what is OVCAN and so the next portion will be on, on how that came to be um, and how we decided what we would do. So OVCAN um, has three main priorities and uh, Alicia Tone has made a lovely infographic that will summarize each of these. The first part is focused on research models. We call this priority one out of three priorities. Um, and it is where we get together with the top investigators in Canada who are in, um, have experience and expertise in developing research models. Now, research models are important because if we come up with what we think might be a new treatment for ovarian cancer, we just can't start injecting it or, or giving it to women who have the disease because it needs to be assured that it's likely to work and that it's safe. And so the first step for any new uh, therapeutic approach is to have good models. And so we have this group of researchers who are experts at making uh, cancer models and particularly ovarian cancer models. And we are trying to make it so that those models will represent every subtype of ovarian cancer, some of which uh, are built on tissue that has been donated by patients. The second arm of 
next uh, of the second priority um, is what we call novel treatments. And the important part of this is to build on Canadian science and all the great ideas that we have about what possible treatments might work in ovarian cancer and use the models that were developed in priority one and apply them and test them with these novel treatments um, in priority two. This strategy is a little different in that we've made it competitive. So the best ideas will be evaluated and funded. Um, so this is a competitive process and there are patient partners who are involved in that process, ensuring that their voice is heard in the decision-making process. These, these trials are being um, um, organized um, nationwide in various labs, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but the whole point is to bring the most promising treatments through the preclinical trial phase, and so that it will lead eventually to the priority three, which is next, and that's um, the personalized clinical trials. The most promising of those novel treatments that look like they could work, we are trying to get into clinical trials as quickly as possible. Um, and you'll see how that's happening in a few slides. And so these are personalized clinical trials. We are, the, the first sets are, have been funded. We're now funding more, um, trying to focus again on the broad spectrum of ovarian cancer, the different subtypes. And again, this is another place where patients play a critical role because they are on the committees um, that are deciding which of these clinical trials will go forward. And there is another set of patients that is involved actively which, at, with every clinical trial group to ensure that the, the rollout of the trial and how it functions has patients in mind at every step of the path. The final step, obviously, when all of these three priorities are completed, is that we will have improved outcomes for women with ovarian cancer. I love the little high fives in the middle. I think that's a nice a celebratory image. Um, because we hope that the findings that we have from the research labs uh, will inform the treatment approaches that are being used both in preclinical studies and ultimately in clinical trials. The outcome of those clinical trials always feeds back into um, the research labs because if the trials work, that's great. There's always a way to improve them. But if the treatment fails, then we need to understand why. And that goes back to the researchers to try to figure out how we can fix what went wrong so it would work better the next time. So what have we achieved so far? Um, well, this is the, the best part. And remember, everything I tell you has been done actively within the past year. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the various research highlights that uh, um, research achievements that we've had in the past year. Um, for priority one, this is the ovarian cancer research models. Um, and as I mentioned, we need those models to test our hypotheses about um, what new treatments might work. And we have to have good models. We have to have models that represent the different types of ovarian cancer. We have to have models that reflect well how a patient will respond to that treatment. And no one model will do that. And so what we have is a collection of models of different kinds in which these novel treatments can be tested. And that can be as simple as surgical tissue. So every uh, ovarian cancer patient or almost all of them will have surgery. Um, we can retrieve some of those samples. And what you see here is it's embedded in wax. Um, and we can use that. We have a collection actually of 2000 ovarian cancer um, cases that have been collected and are well documented. So we can use them for validation purposes. Below that is our cell line. So these, what you see there are ovarian cancer cells in a plastic dish. Um, and they, we can grow them like that. We can throw new treatments on them. We can see how they work. But if you go to the right, there's organoids. And that's where you can take cancer cells and culture them in three-dimensional cultures. So they are in suspension in that plastic dish. Those are what are called ex vivo models. Um, you can also get them directly from ovarian uh, cancer patients, chop up the tumor, and what you have there would be pieces of ovarian tumor floating in the dish. In some cases, those cell lines or those um, organoids are planted directly into mice um, so that they, they will grow tumors that are exactly the same as what the original tumor was. And then those mice can be used to test which treatments might work um, on those, uh, for those ovarian cancer patients. So there's all kinds of models. Um, and the goal for this aim is to actually identify what are the best research models um, that we can use in the Canadian ovarian cancer research community um, how to characterize them so that they are easy to use, most informative, and easily shared. Next slide. So um, I really love this priority because it is unique in our approach. 
There is no competition here. All of the decisions made for priority one is done in a collaborative um, and a strategic way. So what you see here is uh, an image from one of our most recent meetings. Actually, it was at Christmas time because you can see Christmas trees in the background for some of them. Um, and these are individuals who all have expertise in um, creating or characterizing ovarian cancer models. So we all come together and we talk about what are the most promising models, what are likely to be the best models, and how do we characterize them further so that we all share the same set of models, rather than of all of us using different models and therefore tr makes it it's difficult to compare the results that we're getting. If we're all using a similar platform with models that we all recognize and value, then it has huge potential to be used in novel treatments that can be compared among the models and among different research groups across the country. So this group of, of individuals, and this is only a subset of them, have worked very hard to identify what is our best strategy going forward. Once that strategy is identified, then we go back and we say, okay, who is the best one capable of, of doing whatever needs to be done, creating a new model or characterizing it further? They come up with a budget, we assess the budget, and if it's reasonable, that individual will get funded to do that work. So it's entirely collaborative, there's no competition, and we build by consensus. Um, and I do have to, um, you can see here a quote from Dr. David Huntsman, who's a pathologist in, in Vancouver. Um, who participated in this, in this meeting and is a key role um, in the model's development. And he said, I was really impressed with the call you hosted last week. The process was effective up front, but also created a strong atmosphere of collaboration to build from as we move forward. Please don't lose sight on how special that is, and in my experience, how rare. And I think it's a good indication of how the scientists in Canada are happy to work together to put our best foot forward to do what is necessary for ovarian cancer research, regardless of who is doing it um, and which lab is, gets the funding to do so. So I, I'm very proud of that approach and, I'm, and it's working extremely well. So in year one, we had to move quickly because the funding came in and had to go out within a month. Um, so we were able to fund a, a couple of groups um, uh, that were ready and had models that were ready to be characterized. Uh, you can see them in black, um, one at the top and one near the bottom. In the teal in the middle is year two. We had a little bit more time to work on that, um, identify what were the next steps, what kind of new models needed to be developed, which additional models need to be characterized. I'm not gonna go through all these in detail. Obviously that would take another hour on its own. Um, and in year three, we've just started year three. Um, you can see that uh, we have even more models coming on board as we're continuing to, to characterize the models that have been built in year two. By the end of year three, all of this work should be done. Um, year four is dedicated to identifying ways to share the models, to finalize any characterization that is not um, done um, and push them into the novel treatments, the use in the novel treatments for priority two. So I think this has gone, gone swimmingly. Um, I am very happy with the progress in priority one. Um, we will achieve what we set out to do and build actually more models than we had proposed in the first place. So um, I, yeah, this is just a really exciting element for me. Um, I, it is also important to note that we have not focused only on high grade serous, which is an easy pick because there are more uh, cases diagnosed with high grade than any other. It's much harder to go for the cases that are, are less frequent, but we have done it. So we are building either cell culture models or animal models that represent almost all of the different subtypes um, that, are, that are found, whether they be less common or whether they be the mo most common um, high grade serous. So we're getting there. We still have a couple boxes yet to tick, but. Um, it is taking a lot of effort to get us to this point in having both cell culture models and mouse models of all of these different subtypes. Next slide. So I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, this first one is actually from Anne-Marie Mesmasson's lab at Schum in Montreal. Um, and it's a really exciting approach that she is taking to develop, develop what she calls the microfluidic platforms. And so if you start at um, number one, where you see the patient on the bottom, and if that's an ovarian cancer in the pinkish red color, those tumors are removed and she chops them up into what she calls micro dissected tumor or MDTs. Those little pieces of tumor are then put into um, on um, box three, you can see the microfluidic platform. 
and we will see a video of this shortly so be able to see it better but the little tumors are put into each of these platforms and then some are treated and some are not um, so you can have a novel therapy and you have let's say a placebo that will go side by side so you can treat all these tumors at the same time then it moves to four where you analyze that data you see for example how effectively the drug is killing the cells and that will move to then number five where you can summarize all of that data and maybe down the road that will tell you that that drug candidate is the best treatment for that patient so ideally in the longer term this is leading towards personalized medicine where a patient can be um, have, have the tumor removed and ultimately come back and have um, a readout of the various treatments that are that are likely to work in that patient next slide so this is a video of uh, that amory has provided so these are little strips of ovarian cancer um, and they are chopped into smaller little pieces. Um, you can see here they just use a scalpel and a pair of forceps and they chop it into small pieces, try to keep it wet because that's how tissues normally are. This is under a microscope where they use a biopsy needle to take a small little round piece. You can see it, there's the vacant piece. The biopsy would be in the biopsy needle and there you see a whole bunch of them. So they're all the same size. And now she's feeding them into the microfluidics platform. And you can see there's a number of wells and you can see the pieces coming down. Um, and it's like a game where she's pulling the fluid out of one end and pushing it the other to push all the tumors. And now you see all the little pieces in the microfluidics platform. There it is again, you can see them all there. Um, when they've treated them and they're done, they put a dye, uh, sorry, a fixative in there. Or it's like pickling the, the cells so that they will not do anything more. Um, and then they add a pink color because these tumor pieces are so small, you can't see them unless they're colored. And so when that's done, you can actually take this all apart. It's just made of soft plastic. You can peel off the tubing pieces and what's left behind then is just the tumors. And you can see them there, all those little dots, those are the tumors. Um, and then they can take it, clean it up, chop off all the excess plastic that's not needed, which is what they're doing now. And then they put it into a little container um, and then they pour hot wax on it. And that is what normally happens in pathology with tumor pieces, but now we're doing this with teeny tiny tumor pieces. So they embed it in wax, let it sit for a while so that the wax will harden. And then because they can't pick it up very easily, they put a what's called a cassette on top and put more wax on that so that the tumors will now be stuck to this plastic and they can use that for labeling. And then when that's hard, they can go back and they can take that final piece of plastic off the tumors. You can see it being peeled off there. And there you see all the little tumors, all the pink dots are all those tumors. Now they have to cover them with wax to make sure they're not exposed. And then they let that wax harden. So in the end, you have a block of wax and inside it, you have all the little tumors that came out of the microfluidics platform. And um, this is just showing them in the incubator. And there they are. So you can see them all lined up. They'd be in the same order as they were on the microfluidics platform. Um, and now you can take a, a sharp knife. We use a microtome. It's, it's just a sharp knife that will cut sections off of these um, so that you can then look at those tumors and see, did they, did they die with the treatment? Did they do, how did they respond to the treatment um, to see whether that treatment worked or not? So this is a phenomenal technology. Um, Anne-Marie has spent years developing it and it's now ready to be used. Um, and so a lot of the novel treatment strategies that are being tested are using this as one of the model systems um, to see whether their drugs are working or not. The second example is actually coming from my lab. I work with two other groups, um, one at Queens and one at University of Guelph. Um, and we do the syngenetic models for ovarian cancer. And these are critical because um, most of the other model systems uh, use human cells, which is probably more relevant. But if you want to develop an immunotherapy, um, you need to have a system that has a complete immune system to respond to that immunotherapy. Um, and so we need basically an animal or, um, yeah, an animal. And so what we use is mice. Um, immunotherapies to date have not worked particularly well for humans or for women with ovarian cancer. But 15% of women will respond, um, but it's usually not a long lasting response. And so what we need to do is find better ways 
to improve immunotherapies or identify combination therapies that will work better, better together. And so this is fairly straightforward. When you start with the mouse on the left that has a tumor, we remove that tumor and put the tumor cells into a flask with, with a nutrient media so that those tumor cells will grow. And then when we have enough of those cells, we divide them up and we put them in different mice. So we have one set of mice, could be 10 mice that all have the same type of tumor. We would give half a placebo, we would give the new treatment to the other half, and then we wait to see how well that um, treatment has worked in preventing the tumors from growing or to stop them from growing if they're already growing. So those model systems are called syngenaic model systems, and they're incredibly important um, for the development of immunotherapies. Next slide. We have tried one immunotherapy that is used quite commonly in melanoma, for example, as an antibody to PDL1. Um, and you can see in the, in the graph on the left, um, all the green lines are the days when the animals were given a shot of antibody to PDL1. The blue and the black are controls, these are placebo treatments. And the red is the animals who were given anti PDL1. And you can see that the controls um, had to be euthanized by day 31. Thanks, Alicia, <laughs> um, because they were becoming um, um, ill and we don't allow animals to die. We just euthanize them when they start getting ill. Um, and you can see the anti pdl one treatment, those animals lived to, um, to 39 days. And you might say eight days, well, heck, that's not very much. But if you look at the design of the study, that's a 25% longer survival um, than control. And I think if you were to ask any ovarian cancer patient, if we could give them a treatment that would allow them to survive 25% uh, longer after their diagnosis, uh, they'd be likely to be pretty happy with that. So what we're doing now is trying that treatment in combination with um, other um, immunotherapies to see whether we can prolong that even more. Uh, the advantage of these uh, syngenaic models is that we can take immunotherapies and, and tag, um, tag reporters onto them. So we can see exactly where the cancer might be at any point in time. And so uh, you can see the red dots that Alicia's pointing out there. Those are where the ovaries are. You know exactly where the ovarian tumor is because the highest abundance of fluorescence in the red right there is those two ovaries. You can also see all the green and blue in that animal showing that, well, not only is it intensely in the ovaries, but it's everywhere in the abdomen. That is fully disseminated abdominal cancer. The one in the middle um, just has the two uh, tumors starting in the ovaries and they're just starting to spread, but they're not yet everywhere. And the one on the right is just showing that an animal with normal ovaries, you're not going to get any fluorescence. So this is really valuable because we can actually monitor tumor progression without having to kill animals at every stage of the tumor progression. So uh, that's priority one and some of the progress that has been made. Priority two, the focus is novel treatments. Can we use those model systems that we've been developing to test uh, novel treatments? And, and our goal was we wanted to develop um, eight novel treatments, treatments that did not exist currently for ovarian cancer, but that had great promise in previous um, studies. And so our goal was eight. And I say that because we're gonna come back and say why eight was important. Um, and so these were prioritized based on existing data. Um, we set up a competitive process, an open competition, Anyone, anywhere in Canada could apply for these grants. Um, and then there was a grants panel that came together to review those applications. Um, that panel exists, uh, included scientific experts, uh, patients, uh, people who had you know, the best interest of ovarian cancer patients in mind when they assessed these applications to see which um, treatment had the most promise. And so that's what we did. We ran the first competition last year. Uh, next slide, please. It was run in partnership with an organization called Iricor. Um, and we set aside $2.3 million for the development of new treatments for ovarian cancer. Uh, note the date, March 17th, 2020. This is like days after the federal government finally gave us our year one allocation, which really was the last month of year one. And within days, we were able to put this announcement out um, that tells you how much work went on in the background before year one was even completed. Um, and so we were excited to get this off the ground and the competition ran last year. And next slide, we have three grants that were funded. Um, so this is exciting. Um, these are really um, uh, all sort of top 
leading edge, let's say, research in Canada done in three different labs. Uh, this one is by Julian Lum. Uh, he's at the Dealey Research Cancer Center in Victoria. Um, and his is uh, based on a novel treatment approach called CAR T cells, um, which has not been used for ovarian cancer yet, but he has a novel approach to modify the expression of a gene involved in metabolism, uh, specifically in those T cells. So on, on step one, you see there, the, the strategy is to remove the immune cells from a patient's blood and the immune cells that are removed are called T cells. Those T cells are put in a dish in the lab and genetically altered to make them have um, more proteins, uh, certain proteins being present um, that are tumor fighting. They then enrich for those two cells and then inject them back into the patient. And the, the intent is then for those two cell, T cells to be very effective in then going and finding those cancer cells and killing them. Um, so this is a very promising approach and especially the way that Dr. Lum has proposed it. And the goal is at the end of this two year study, he will be ready to submit a phase one clinical trial application on that method if it, should, if it uh, turns out to be effective. So this is very exciting. The second project is by Dr. Claude Perrault in, at the Université de Montréal. Um, and he's into looking, look, uh, plans uh, to look uh, or to develop ovarian cancer vaccines. Um, you have to know that normal cells have identity factors, like that they're called antigens. They're the, the cells that show to the immune system, I'm here, but I'm normal. Um, and so the immune system goes around the body looking for strangers and they'll see, you know, there's, there's Charlie and there's Sam and there's Gertrude. And, but if the tumor is present, the tumor has a way of having identity factors that some of which are different. So as immune cells are going around, they'll say, they say Sam and they say Charlie, but then they'll say, oh, that's a Harry. That's not, that's not our, that's not, that's a stranger. He doesn't belong here. And they will do their best to, to try to kill that cell, but it doesn't always work, which is why tumors grow. So what Dr. Pro is doing is he's taking all these stranger antigens, these identity factors that tumors produce that are strangers to the immune system. And he's building vaccines so that they can target those cancer cells much more effectively. So again, another very effective strategy if it works. Um, and his team also is ready to begin a phase one, two clinical trial at the end of this two years, if he can develop a vaccine that works very well in the preclinical studies. And the third one is um, Dr. jean Simon Diallo. He's actually here at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Um, he comes from a, a history of oncolytic virus uh, treatments, um, lots of expertise. Um, it is a strength here in Ottawa and he's coupling it um, to an antibody to help guide it to the ovarian cancer. Um, and then do, that combination would be more effective. So when an oncolytic virus infects a normal cell, it can get in but the normal cell sees it as foreign and it prevents it from replicating, from dividing. And so the normal cell is unharmed. But when an oncolytic virus goes into a tumor cell, the virus is able in that environment to not only infect, but to replicate, to grow like mad. And eventually that causes the cancer cell to die. The problem is getting to ensure that the oncolytic virus gets to the tumor cell. And that's where this antigen, this, this identity factor for cancer cells is called HER2. And Jean Simon is actually taking her to and attaching it to an oncolytic virus in a way that allows the HER2 to target the cancer and the oncolytic virus to infect that tumor cell um, and kill it. So it's a one-two punch and it has a lot of promise. Kidzilla the, is the antibody for HER2. It's already approved in breast cancer. Um, it doesn't work as well on its own in ovarian cancer. So the hope is that, again, this one, two punch is going to be better than one or the other alone. So those are the three that have been funded. Um, and we have one, one second round, and it's the final round for uh, priority two on novel treatments. Um, and those applications are due in July. We have set aside, I think it's 1.35 million uh, to fund six grants. Um, so right away you see, we've already funded three, we're gonna be funding six. That means we are able to introduce nine novel treatments into preclinical trials. So we are actually exceeding what we originally thought we would be able to do with this funding, um, which is very exciting. Um, and so those six grants will be funded by the end of the year. Um, and they too will also be uh, focused on novel treatments, which may benefit women. In this case, we're trying to focus as much as we can on the less common subtypes. 
I can tell you that we had 47 letters of intent that were received by the deadline on April 29th. They came from scientists across Canada. Um, uh, I think at least 10 of them are focused on the less common subtypes. And here is my pitch to you. We have 47 promising projects to focus on novel treatments for ovarian cancer. We will be able to fund six. So an answer to the question that I sometimes get, if you've already got $10 million from the federal government, why do you need my money? This is why. We are able to only fund 13% of the best ideas in Canada for advancing new treatments for ovarian cancer. Um, next slide, please. Priority three is the clinical trials. And this obviously is when it starts to get really exciting because if any of these treatments move into clinical trials, uh, that means that there are better options for women who have, who have this disease. Um, and so we're trying to get new ideas into clinical trials as quickly as possible. Um, the goals here were to fund early phase clinical trials to bring those promising treatments to Canadian women specifically, um, and to advance clinical trials by uh, using experimental treatments um, that can be stratified. So uh, low grade serous cancer um, patients then would be given treatments that are more um, aligned with the, the deficiencies that are present in their tumors that is causing their tumors to grow. And likewise for the other subtypes, um, and you'll see some examples coming up. So we're, we're trying to use the characteristics of the tumor to help identify what patients, what uh, treatments are best for that patient. So the priorities are for translational studies. Again, this, me this means including samples of tissue or blood from the patients at different times during their course or their treatment. Um, because if it doesn't work, we're gonna wanna know, out, know why, and that's best done by using those tissues and blood samples to see how well those tissues responded to the treatment. We want a national in scope, as many cancer patients as possible having access to these trials. We want it built on Canadian science because we have great ideas. We just need to have the opportunity to move them forward. Um, and patient engagement is involved at every step of the way. Um, every clinical trial team includes patients who are part of that team to provide their perspective on what should be done. So we've awarded so far uh, $2.6 million um, for four groundbreaking clinical trials for women with, living with ovarian cancer. And normally in the plan, we would have waited until after priority one and priority two were done before we could start priority three. But because the federal government curtailed our five years really till four, we had to start right away. And we did a competition already last year and those four trials were, were approved. So the first one here is, uh, has the lead of Zach, Zach, um, Dr. Diane Provencher from uh, Schumann Montreal. Um, this one is focusing on PARP inhibitors, which are currently approved for BRCA mutation carriers, um, those women with high-grade serous and BRCA mutations. Um, um, but she thinks that could be done even better with, by the addition of an apoptosis inhibitor. So they are, it's quite, we can increase survival quite a bit um, in those women, but maybe we could do even better by combination treatment. So she secured the blood supply, the, sorry, the drug supply, and it's got the protocol um, completed and anticipates um, bringing in patients fairly soon. So there's 30 women with high grade serous ovarian cancer at three different sites in Quebec and Ontario who will be part of that trial. The second one um, is led by Dr. Amit Oza and Dr. Stephanie Leroux at uh, University Health Network in Toronto. Um, they, and I have to say all of these are PARP related because that is the thing right now is that we've just started within two years giving PARP uh, treatments to women but we know that there, there's ways to improve it. And so that's what all of these are, are doing is optimizing the PARP treatments. The next round of, of clinical trials will focus on more novel approaches, but these are all novel treatments are not being done anywhere. Um, and so the question is, when do we give the PARP inhibitor? Currently it can be given as maintenance, but Dr. Lara and Oza are trying to assess whether it's even better if it's given before surgery. So it's called the NEO trial. And so there'll be 71 women with high-grade serous uh, platinum sensitive or recurrent cancer um, at four different sites in Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta. Um, they've already recruited 41 patients to date. And the, 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 if you want more information, in pink in the bottom is the go to clinicaltrials.gov. And the trial number is there. You can look it up and be able to see um, where those uh, sites are and 
Um, there's a lot of information coming from this because they're actually doing whole exome or whole genome sequencing um, of the cases, um, just starting that. So we'll have a lot more information about the response of those patients to these PARP inhibitors um, right at the get-go. The third one is uh, a separate one that was submitted by Dr. Oza, um, where he's um, looking at women who have become resistant to PARP inhibitors. So we're finding that there are some women who are initially responsive but become resistant or who are never responsive in the first place. Um, and so he has a new compound that he thinks might be able to overcome that resistance. And so he's, his plan is to put 20 to 30 women with ovarian cancer um, on that trial. It's estimated to open uh, this spring uh, at Princess Margaret. Um, and he's looking at the ability of being able to offer this trial to other centers in Canada as well. And the final one is by Stephanie Leroux, um, again from Toronto. Um, and she's looking at using a personalized medicine approach to individualizing treatment for women who are resistant to PARP inhibitors. That trial is called the REVOLVE trial. Um, and uh, in her trial, up to 100 women with high-grade serous or endometrioid recurrent ovarian cancer will be recruited at eight different sites in Canada. And again, all the components are almost there, the drug supply and whatnot, um, to make sure that it'll be ready to launch within the next couple of months. So those are the first four that were funded. And I can tell you, we have more on the way. We have just today um, are accepting the deadline for the letters of intent for a second and final round for clinical trial applications. There is $2.2 million available and we are encouraging um, leadership from across Canada. And again, the women um, who are diagnosed with less common types of ovarian cancer, we want to address their needs as well. And so additional emphasis will be on those um, less common types. So we're off and running and there's gonna be more coming in the next uh, a year or two. Um, I do need to thank the patients. Um, for every step of the way, the patients have been involved in terms of helping us lobby, helping us lobby, helping us lobby. Uh, helping on the grants panels, helping on the clinical trials groups every step of the way. There's some on the governing council. Um, these women are tremendous. Um, the group called Partners, pa Patient Partners in Research. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting with them about a month ago talking about our research, but they are um, well informed and they are making sure that we are well informed as well so that we always take into, into account um, their uh, experiences and perspectives. And I do need to thank them most sincerely. Um, and they are, there's a special session on them next, so you'll hear a lot more about them shortly. And so this is all of us. The ones in bold are the governing council, but this is a team that is national. Um, Alicia has put the number of, of researchers or, or participants from coast to coast. And you can see we are from coast to coast. Um, so um, I'm very proud of this group, very happy to be working with them and particularly pleased that Ofcan has, been a, has made such huge achievements in the short time that we've been able to have the funds to do so. Um, and I thank you. I'm happy to answer questions if there's time. Thanks, Barb. I just love listening to you, Barb, and your passion and your excitement just comes through. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, we do have some questions here today for you. Um, so we'll get to those. We have a few minutes here. So first question, Barb, why are we limiting ourselves to Canadian research? So mostly because we have a lot of ideas and there hasn't until now been a lot of funding to put those ideas forward. Uh, funding in Canada is much more restricted than the United States, for example. Um, so they have lots of money to advance their own scientists' ideas. They will not put a lot of money in Canada to invest uh, to advance ours. And so um, it's not to say we're ignoring what's going on in the world, actually quite contrary. Every time we come to the table, we bring all of our co uh, international collaborators sort of with us to the table. So we're not duplicating what's going on elsewhere. We're putting new ideas forward. Okay, thank you. Next question. And we've had this question a couple times. Uh, any reason why immunotherapy has such low success rates for ovarian cancer? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough, a tough one. It's a part is not, uh, I think ovarian cancer is a tough cancer to start with. Um, and there are very few cancers that it turns out that immunotherapies are successful with the initial 
types of immunotherapies that were put forward. So the initial sets that are working best are called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there's three or four that have been approved and they work really well with some cancer types. Melanoma being the classic sort of one that everybody uses as an example. But many of the other tumors do not respond as well, tumor types, including ovarian. Um, and it might be what we think is that the, if you look inside the tumors, an ovarian tumor, it has a really uh, creative way of trying to keep immune cells out. Um, it produces, the cancer cells produce a lot of what we call immunosuppressive factors. They will prevent the, the, the immune cells from coming into the tumor to start with. So if you can't get the immune cells in, you can't activate them in the tumor to kill the cancer cells. So that's what the one advantage of oncolytic viruses are. Oncolytic viruses can get into the tumors because it can get in through the bloodstream. It doesn't, and it can avoid all the immune, um, it doesn't matter whether there's immune cells yet there or not, it goes directly to the cancer cells. So I think other immunotherapies are likely to work. It's just that the immune checkpoint inhibitors, the anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1, anti-CTLA-4, those ones are not showing a lot of promise on their own in ovarian cancer. Right now, there's probably two dozen or more trials doing combinations where that might show some better, um, better success. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. I have read an article that states there is some indication that the quick advancement of the mRNA vaccine for COVID-19 has advanced up to 10 years its possible use for cancer, in particular, ovarian cancer. Is there any veracity to this article? So yeah, mRNA vaccines obviously are the success story of, of the COVID. And it, it is built on you know, at, at least a decade of research by some Canadians even as well. Um, and that's why they were able to be developed so quickly. Um, and I think part one of the, the treatments I talked about is built on not an mRNA vaccine, but similar strategy um, to build a vaccine that will target ovarian cancer. The problem is we don't have a spike protein um, in ovarian cancer. But what Dr. Perot has found is he's found 55 unique tumor antigens in ovarian cancer. So that's like 55 spike proteins that can be used to target. Um, and so that would be one approach is to take any one of those 55, make an RNA that will encode that, that one of that antigen and that would allow the immune cells to, to work. So yes, it could. And not only in ovarian, but in other cancers as well. Exciting, thank you. Um, are any of the trials in this section dealing with women that do not have BRCA? So in the first set, it's all focused on PARP inhibitors because when we started this, that's what was up and coming. Um, and so we could build on that and find even better ways to, to expand on those trials. But now we've had time um, to allow clinicians mostly to develop um, um, trial applications. And so what's coming in now will be, as I said, the focus is on this current round of competition, um, applications that are not focused on high-grade serous even, but are focused on the less common subtypes. So a part of it is, is just a matter of timing. We had to go with what we had on hand and what worked uh, quickly uh, in the first year, but now we have time to, to add in the, the pieces that we're missing in that first round. Excellent. I know a lot of women will be happy to hear that. Yeah, we're, 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 we're listening. Will a portion of any of the funds ever be put towards finding a more reliable biomarker for screening surveillance for high-risk patients? Uh, not in not this original OFCAN five-year project. When we set out the plan, we sent uh, I, I sent the request to every clinician and scientist across Canada who works in ovarian cancer and said, if we had $10 million, what's the best way to have the most impact on, on, on women in the time frame that we would have. And almost all came back with better treatments, better treatments, better treatments. We need to have better models to build better treatments, which is why the strategy was put forward. Prevention is not off the radar. I just got a grant in the fall from CHR on a prevention study. So we haven't ignored um, prevention at all. The researchers have not, um, or, the, or the clinicians for that matter. There is a currently a clinical trial on prevention going on that's based in Toronto, I know. So we haven't forgotten it. It's just that Ofcan had to be focused in a way we could present the idea to the government that they would res be responsive to it. Um, prevention requires women who don't have the disease, which requires everybody. And to be honest, when we developed the strategy, 
two major trials had just been completed, one in the US and one in the UK. And they had tried different strategies for identifying early stage cancers, screening for early stage cancers. And both of those trials found that even if they could pick up a few more cases of ovarian cancer, a few more women with ovarian cancer, the overall survival did not change. So the strategies they were using, and those were the, the norm at the time, CA-125 and ultrasound, was, was not successful in identifying women early enough in a way that would, would change their overall uh, survival. So we, everybody's gone back to the drawing board and is trying different strategies. Uh, clearly prophylactic uh, surgery is, uh, is one of the number one ways that people are uh, advising right now. So if a woman is at high risk, she's done having her children, prophylactic surgery to remove um, the tissues, the ovary and the, uh, and the distal fallopian tube is probably the best preventative strategy. And I know how harsh that is and I fully understand this is surgery and this isn't fun. Um, but for high risk women, that, that is an effective strategy. Um, oral contraceptives actually reduce ovarian cancer risk as well. So even in the meantime, uh, the use of oral contraceptives um, can't hurt. Um, but yes, we, it, the, the, the community that is, that is involved in OVCAN also have other work that they're doing on this side and prevention is, is certainly up among them. Thanks, Barb. We have time for one final question. Um, there are more that are unanswered, so we will try to get back to you on those, but we have time for one more live today. Um, and it is, is Canada a leading country for ovarian cancer research if we are building on Canadian science? Yes, yes. I have, I, there's next, this next week, next Thursday, Friday, we have an ovarian cancer uh, uh, conference here. It was one that we started in 2002 and it happens every two years. There are people from Australia coming. And when that conference was in person, they were coming from Germany, uh, and they're coming to Canada. So we are a big player. Our clinical trials are part of clinical trials all in North America. Um, and the researchers here, it's still a building community, but the ideas that are coming out of here um, are as competitive, if not more so than many other major countries. So yes, we are big players in the world. And especially because now of Afghan. Awesome. Barb, thank you. That's all the time we have today. That so exciting. And like I said, your, your passion shines through and it's truly inspiring to hear from you. So uh, thank you for spending some time with us today. Um, provinces are also stepping forward to augment that initial $10 million investment into ovarian cancer research. Um, Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan are building on this bold leadership move at the provincial level and have added an additional $1 million per province to bolster Ovarian Cancer Canada's research initiatives. So we're now going to hear from Dr. Laura Hopkins, who will tell us a bit more about the investment in Saskatchewan, and from Dr. Katerina Kaiser, who will tell us a little bit more about the investment in Nova Scotia. My name is Laura Hopkins and I'm a gynae oncologist and provincial lead for gynecologic cancer in the province of Saskatchewan. I'm excited to provide an overview of our planned initiatives for women with ovarian cancer. The first project focuses on opportunistic salpingectomy. This is the very best way to prevent the most common type of ovarian cancer. We did a survey in this province and found that only 36% of Practicing OBGYNs offer opportunistic salpingectomy for women at the time of cesarean section when they request permanent contraception. We intend to implement an education initiative to increase this practice in the province. The second project is focusing on the management of anemia in ovarian cancer patients on treatment. We know that about 30 to 60% of all women with all stages of ovarian cancer develop anemia at some point during their care. This initiative is gonna be organized as a randomized control trial. The control arm will be management of anemia according to physician discretion, which is the current standard of care. And the experimental arm will be management of anemia using intravenous iron supplementation. We intend to look at quality of life and as well overall survival as outcomes. 
The third initiative we have concerns the educational needs of women with ovarian cancer in the recurrent setting. We'll plan to survey women and find out how we can improve the types of care initiatives and recommendations that we offer women at this stage in their disease. And finally, we plan to implement tumor testing and precision medicine in ovarian cancer care. We will per be performing molecular tumor testing for all women with ovarian cancer and then use that information to clearly and transparently advise women as to which drugs they stand to benefit from. We already have the wherewithal uh, and the ability to use genomics in cancer care and it's time to get started. Creation of the first tumor bank in Saskatchewan is linked with this study and we'll soon be able to select women for clinical trial participation based on the findings from analysis of their own specific tumor. We can also use the tumor bank specimens to look for new bio biomarkers that can help us find new treatments for women with cancer. These are exciting times for women with ovarian cancer and the province of Saskatchewan. We're so grateful to Ovarian Cancer Canada and the Saskatchewan Ministry of Health for making all this possible. Thanks and have a good day. Hello and happy World Ovarian Cancer Day. I'm Katrina Kieser, uh, part of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology here in Nova Scotia. As many of you know, uh, our Premier a few years ago donated a million dollars to ovarian cancer research uh, and we've had an exciting group come together uh, over that, uh, a group of basic scientists uh, including immunology and genetics, uh, epidemiologists, geneticists uh, and our clinical group as well of gynecologic oncologists. Uh, over our meetings, uh, there have been some exciting thoughts and, and progress in terms of our plan uh, for the future. We've already got a tissue bank uh, going and are able to contribute both to uh, local research with this uh, as we move forward as well as national research, period. Our epidemiologic research has also uh, started looking at the Nova Scotian population and how uh, we might uh, improve on different areas of our delivery of care to Nova Scotia. I think this is exciting for our group and we're uniquely positioned for some of these uh, projects. Uh, it's wonderful to see the crossover of the group and I look forward to giving you an update in the near future. Thank you both for those updates. Um, after listening to Barb and to Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Kieser, we truly are in exciting times here. So now we will ask you to please join us for the next section, session, sorry, um, which is another part of the OVCAN initiative. Barb touched on it briefly and a super important part. Uh, it's the largest of its kind in Canada, the Patient Partners in Research Program. So if you move over to the left of your screen, under the sessions tab, you'll see the session titled Meet the OVCAN Patient Partners in Research, and we'll see you over there. <laughs> 